Good morning, everybody. All right. Well, last week I said that we were going to complete Genesis in five weeks, and we did. But we got one more little P.S. postscript message today, so hopefully you guys are ready. Um, so open your Bibles, if you have them, to the book of Genesis, chapter 1. Uh, we're going to preach through Genesis all over again, so hopefully, no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. There's, before we move on from the book of Genesis, there was one more, there's one more lesson that I wanted us to sit with uh, before we move on into another book in the Bible. My hope is that you begin to see the richness of the Old Testament, specifically the richness of Genesis as we go through the Word today. It's the living and active, supernaturally empowered, eternal Word of God. It's really humanity's first hyperlinked book ever. Uh, I don't know if you've seen this image. Uh, Jordan Peterson popularized it. It's a cross-reference image of the Bible. It's humanity's first hyperlink book having 65,000 cross-references. Uh, there's no other book that even comes close. Um, the Quran has less than 5,000. The Bible has 65,000. God was weaving this story together. See, when you're writing a book, it's important that you know where the ending is going and so that you can write the beginning appropriately and weave the story in together all throughout to the end. And if I may go a step farther, I would say that the Scriptures reveal specifically not only who God is, but the Scriptures reveal Jesus Christ. John 5, Jesus said this to the Pharisees, You search the Scriptures because you think in them you have eternal life, but it is these that bear witness of me, Scriptures. Yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. For if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote of me. It's a wild statement Jesus makes to the Pharisees. The Scriptures that you're reading are all about me. Luke 24, and beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. This was Jesus walking along with the two on the Emmaus Road. Jesus begins to unfold Moses and the prophets, the Old Testament, and he points out in those places where he can be revealed. Later in that chapter, he says this, and then he said to him, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was with you that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms, written about me in these areas, would be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the Scriptures. It's as if God gave us like a supernatural ability to have this veil removed to see Christ in the Old Testament. See, there's more to the text than usually we tend to see. The Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. The New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. That's a little Bible school, a little, you, you should memorize that. But the, the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. It's hidden in shadow and types. But the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. So when we're reading the Old Testament, when you're reading the Old Testament, a great primary question to ask yourself is, what does this reveal to me or us about Christ? As you're reading through the Old Testament, as you're reading through the Psalms or the prophets or the Pentateuch, which is what Moses wrote, what does this reveal about Christ? And so before we move on from Genesis, I wanted to go back in Genesis and pick out a handful of points that actually preach the gospel in Genesis, and we can see Christ. So let's pray, and then we'll dive in. Holy Spirit, thank you, God, for your eternal, life-giving word. God, I pray that, Lord, if we walked in here with any eyes of familiarity, Lord, things, oh, I've heard that before. God, I pray that you would just rip that out of our operating system. God, I pray that you would create a hunger and a thirst for your word. God, I pray that you would create a hunger for you, that we would not be distracted by lesser things. Father, let us focus on you and your word. 
in our time together. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So let's start right from the very first verses of the scriptures. Genesis 1, 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. The first recorded words of God, let there be light. They're packed with significance. And could it not be described in four words what the gospel is? Let there be light. Compare it to what we see in the New Testament. The Apostle John using the image of light when he introduces Jesus in his gospel. John 1, in the beginning the Word already existed. The Word was with God. The Word was God. He existed in the beginning. God created everything through him, and nothing was created except through him. The word gave life to everything that was created, and his life brought light to everyone. The light that shines in the darkness, the darkness cannot extinguish it. Do we not see the same picture that Moses and Genesis laid out? The spirit hovering over the darkness, and then light comes in. Light overpowering the darkness. We see that in creation, and we see that in Christ. Paul's making the same connection in 2 Corinthians 4. It says, For if the good news we preach is hidden, or if the good news we preach is hidden behind the veil, it's hidden only from people who are perishing. Satan, who is the God of this world, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. They're unable to see the glorious light of the good news. They don't understand this message about the glory of Christ, who is the exact likeness of God. For God, who said, let there be light in the darkness, has made this light shine in our hearts so that we could know the glory of God that is seen in the face of Jesus Christ. We now have this light shining in our hearts. That same light that God created the universe with, let there be light. Paul is saying, because of Christ, who is that light, that same light can live in you. Let there be light. Let there be light. That's where we are. We're enveloped in darkness without him. Apart from him, apart from the work of, of God in our life, there's darkness in us. There's darkness over us. Darkness follows us. You're asking yourself, man, why is it... Why is my life so dark? Well, maybe it's a clue for the Lord, from the Lord, for to push you towards the light, to push you towards Christ. It's the same way when he works with us. When God calls us to faith, to life in his son, it's his word that gives us life. God says it, let there be light, and it happens. We don't create faith in our hearts or dispel darkness. God does that. God is the one that dispels darkness. Creation is the same as conversion. He brings all things into being by his grace and power. And in conversion, he brings us into being his children by his grace and by his power. Let there be light. So see, just in the first three verses, we can see how it's pointing towards Christ. Let's pick up another one. God is in the garden. Genesis 2, we're looking at how we can see Christ in Genesis. Genesis 2, verse 8, Then the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he placed a man that he had made. The Lord God made all sorts of trees grow up from the ground, trees that were beautiful, that produced delicious fruit. So God plants a garden in the east of Eden. You're like, man, how in the world are you going to pull the gospel out of these two verses? But see, God created this habitation for man. He puts him in it, but that's also the very place where he puts his presence. That's where his presence was. See, God, yes, God is everywhere, but God locates himself and locates his presence in one location. So the question to ask God, is there anything that here reveals Christ? Well, 
We continue to see God locating himself in his presence in a particular location throughout the Old Testament. After God revealed himself to Abraham, to the time of Moses, there were altars built in honor of what God has done. And it was at those altars that a lot of times God would meet with his people. And then in Exodus, where God instructed them to build a tabernacle, a roaming tent. And then throughout the Old Testament, you have the temple. God always had a specific place where he could be found. God wants us to know exactly where he can be found at all times. It's one of the witnesses he gave to humanity. You can find me here. We can come to him where he wants us to be, where we can have a face-to-face interaction. So where specifically has God promised us that he could be found today? Ten different locations? Twelve different holy spots? No, it's in one location. The location is found in Christ, where we can find God, because he is the temple. He is the one who came and tabernacled among us. And that's why Paul can say, Corinthians, uh, or Colossians 2.9, says, for in Christ lives all the fullness of God in a human body. He, God came down and tabernacled among us. And from that point on, Humanity can forever find God. It's found in Christ. See, even in these small little verses, God's word speaks his gospel from beginning to end. How about this? This is a fun one. Genesis 2. It's in how God created Eve from Adam. Genesis 2.21. So, God caused caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. While the man slept, the Lord God took out one of the man's ribs and closed up the opening. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib, and he brought her to the man. At last, exclaimed the man, this one is bone from my bone and flesh from my flesh. She will be called woman because she was taken from a man. This explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. Now the man and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. This is, the, this is the creation account of Eve. Just before this, God forms Adam and gives him something to do. He gives him a job to do in the garden. Cultivate it and keep it. To extend the gardens to the ends of the earth. To serve and to keep. To avoid and to shamar. To avoid and shamar. This is the exact same instructions God gives the priests in the temple after the giving of the law. To avoid and shamar. To keep, to cultivate, and to keep. This is a priestly role. He gives Adam. And then in verse 18, just before this, he said it's not good for man to be alone. It's the first time in the creation account that we hear something's not good. And it's that Adam is alone. So what's lacking? If, if Adam is alone, he can't make children. Man can't produce children alone. That's probably a hard fact, you know, to maybe accept today. Praise God. All right, number two, God himself is a trinity of persons. And so for Adam to reflect God, he needs to be in communion with others to share that share the same nature. He needs to reflect God. Therefore, God takes... From the man's side, a rib, and creates woman. Adam's wife, Eve. Now, do we not see a similar picture with Christ on the cross? And it is from his pierced side that water and blood flow. And on that day, something was birthed, and it was his bride the church. It's the same type of creation that out of the side of the God-man on the cross, he births his church so that they may together cultivate and keep to extend the boundaries of the kingdom of God to the ends of the earth. Christ restored mankind's authority and power to work with Christ, work with God to see his kingdom 
expand to the ends of the earth. Even how God creates Eve speaks to Christ and his church. See how rich Genesis becomes? How about this? Genesis 6, you have the ark of God. You have Noah in the ark. The whole story is a message of salvation. God sovereignly chooses Noah, a righteous man, as the conduit of God making all things new. God was so patient and long-suffering with humanity before the flood. There's so much evil. The Bible says there's so much evil. There's not even a good intention in the heart of man. It was all evil. Yet due to the evilness of man, he brought judgment so that he could make all things new. The ark. It was through water that wickedness was washed away. He tells Noah exactly how to build the ark in conformity to God's plan of salvation. Through the wood of creation, through the wood of creation that God made, he would bring deliverance. The ark is a foreshadowing of who Christ is for humanity. It's through the wood of the cross, like the door that you could enter and be saved into the ark, the piercing of Jesus' body and the new covenant made by God giving us the means through his blood and water baptism, we too may enter into Christ so that we too may be saved. He is your ark. He is all of our arks so that we would be safe in his body, safe in his presence, safe from condemnation. Romans 8.1, you're no longer under condemnation. You're joined with Christ in baptism. Peter saw this. Those who disobeyed God long ago when God waited patiently while Noah was building his boat, only eight people were saved from drowning in that terrible flood. And that water is a picture of baptism which now saves you, not by the removing of dirt from your body, but as a response to God from a clean conscience. It is effective because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This whole story of God saving humanity through the ark is a picture forward. It's a foreshadowing of what Christ does with us. The same picture that you have with the Israelites who were, in slave, who were it's enslaved by Egypt. A little while later, they move out. They move out from Egypt. They cross the Red Sea and into the Promised Land. That's the same type of picture about what happens when people follow Christ. They're in slavery they begin following Christ through the waters of baptism into the promised land. The whole, the, God's word speaks about Christ. All right. A couple more. You guys ready for this? Is this all right? You guys feeling good? All right. Praise God. All right. Let's go. Um, Isaac. We touched on Isaac a few weeks ago. Here you have the entire passion of the Christ in the Old Testament. Embodied as a prophecy of what the Messiah would accomplish for us. See if you can see the similarities. I'm just going to read, but see what, see what pops off to you when we're reading this. Genesis 22.3, it says, The next morning Abraham got up early. He saddled his donkey and took two of his servants with him, along with his son Isaac. Then he chopped wood for a fire for a burnt offering and set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day of their journey, Abraham looked up and saw a place in the distance. Stay here with the donkey, Abraham told his servants. The boy and I will travel a little farther. We will worship there, and then we will come right back. So Abraham placed the wood for the burnt offering on Isaac's shoulders, while he himself carried the fire and the knife, and the two of them walked on together. Isaac turned to Abraham and said, Father, yes, my son. Abraham replied, we have fire and the wood, but where is the sheep for the burnt offering? God will provide a sheep for the burnt offering, my son, Abraham answered. And they both walked on together. When they arrived at the place where God had told him to go, Abraham built an altar and arranged the wood on it. Then he tied his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on the top of the wood. And Abraham picked up the knife to kill his son as a sacrifice. At that moment, the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. Yes, Abraham replied, here I am. Don't lay a hand on the boy. 
the angel said. Do not hurt him in any way, for now I know that you truly fear God. You have not withheld from me even your son, your only son. I think he had a few other sons in that. Anyway, then Abraham looked up and saw a ram caught by its horns in a thicket. So he took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering in place of his son. Abraham named the place Yahweh Yaira, which means the Lord will provide. To this day, people still use that name as a proverb. On the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. So Abraham and Isaac are walking towards the mountain. Isaac carries the wood for the sacrifice. On this mountain, Abraham built an altar and arranged the wood on it. Then he tied his son and laid him on top of the wood. God leads them to this particular place, and it's a, place, it's a mountain called Mount Moriah. Now, Mount Moriah would, will later become very significant. This is the first time we see it, of Abraham offering Isaac. God led them specifically to this specific mountain. Mount Moriah. It was the same mountain that David later sacrificed to uh, stave off the, a plague in the nation of Israel. And it's the exact same place that Solomon, his son, will build the temple of God. It's where Jerusalem is. It's where the temple is. That's the exact spot God leads Abraham and Isaac to do this. It was specifically the angel of the Lord that came. He acts and speaks as God, this angel. You have not withheld your son, your only son. It's interesting, that phrase. See, Abraham had other sons, but Isaac was the son of promise. See, the early church fathers identified this angel as the second person of the Trinity, Jesus. The very one who calls out of heaven and stops Abraham is the very one who will one day take the place of Isaac on the altar on that exact same mountain thousands of years later, Christ. See, it's on the same mountain. Jesus said, I will take his spot as a sacrifice for all mankind. Last one that I want to run through before we close is Joseph. Joseph is a quick one. Joseph we talked about last week. Um, Here's some similarities that we find between Joseph and Jesus. Joseph is a type and shadow of Christ. Here's their similarities. (laughs) Their occupation, they were both servants. They were hated by their brethren, brethren because who he was and because of his words. They were both sent forth by their father. They both were conspired against. Their their words were disbelieved. They were insulted. They were stripped. They were both sold, one by Judah, one by Judas. They were both tempted but sinned not. They They were both falsely accused. They made no defense when accused. They cast into prison without a verdict. They suffered at the hand of Gentiles. They numbered with the transgressors. There were two with Jesus and there were two with Joseph. Interesting. They were 30 years old when they both came to power, and they, and they both dispense bread, the bread of life, to the nations. There's actually over 100 similarities in between Joseph and Christ. Wow. God is orchestrating a story pointing forward to his son. And that's the lenses that we want to have when we read the Old Testament. God What is this revealing to me about Christ? How have you wove this story together from thousands of years to I don't know when this thing's going to end, but you're going to culminate this thing in a beautiful way. All right, last one. The river of God. In Genesis 2.10, it says, The river flowed from the land of Eden, watering the garden and then dividing into four branches. So from Eden... From this place of God's presence, there was this river that was flowing out of Eden to the rest of the world. A few thousand years later, Ezekiel, God's prophet at the time, has a vision. And it's a vision of God's temple. And flowing out of this temple 
what began as a small little trickle, the angel takes Ezekiel, and he goes around the temple, and he sees this little trickle come out of the temple door, and he leads him all along the path where this little stream, and as the angel leads Ezekiel down, the stream gets deeper and deeper and deeper, as if God's presence is getting thicker and thicker and thicker. And then the, it, it ends with this picture that we find in Ezekiel 47, verse 12. He saw, and on this river there were fruit trees of all kinds that grew along both sides of the river. The leaves of these trees will never turn brown and fall, and there will always be fruit on their branches. There will be a new crop every month, for they are watered by the river flowing from the temple. The fruit will be food and leaves for healing. Fruit for food, leaves for healing. This is the vision that Ezekiel has. Wow, there's God's presence is flowing out of the temple into the desert. And through the picture, it leads into their Dead Sea and makes the Dead Sea alive again. But this river outpouring from God's holy sanctuary, it seems like Ezekiel truly tapped into God's heart. For we see the Apostle John completing the picture that Ezekiel 47 brings up. And we go from the very beginning of the book to the very end of the book in Revelation 22. It says, Then the angel of the Lord showed me a river, a river of the water of life, as clear as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, down the middle of the great street of the city. In each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and His servants will serve Him. They will see His face, and His name will be on their foreheads. There will be no, means, there will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. This river that began in Genesis, Ezekiel has a vision of that same river. There's something happening with that river. God is, God is building that river up. He's flowing his presence from the temple. And then in Revelation 22, we see this, this coming together. The angel showed him the river coming from the throne and from the Lamb. The Lamb's the source of the river. Not, as he, not only is he the source of light, he's the source of water that cleanses and heals the nations. What was a desert in Ezekiel, Ezekiel's picture was the river running through this desert. Now in Revelation, you have this river running through an entire city kingdom of God has become populated with his people. And like I said, the source of the river all along was God and the Lamb. This is the vision of the church's glorious future, of God's sons and daughters, the earthly and the heavenly, mending the fabric that was torn in the garden of Genesis. David Children wrote this, in Revelation, we see man redeemed brought back to the mountain, sustained by the river and the tree of life, gaining his lost dominion and ruling as a priest king over the earth. Being in Christ, this is our privilege and heritage now, definitively and progressively in, the, in this age, and will be ours fully in the age to come. Paradise is being restored. And these, this is one of the reasons why God's sons and daughters in this season need to have God's lenses over, over our generation, over what's happening around us. Because there's so much around us that will keep us from seeing the promise of God. Even me just reading that. Man, look at the future that we have. A lot of you in your own mind is like, yeah, but have you seen the scene today? Have, do you know what it's like today? Man, there's so much evil out there today. Maybe you're just coming to realize how evil the world has always been. And we need Christ. He is the only answer. It's not a political party. Now, policies matter. 
but the salvation that all of our hearts are looking for does not come from a man. It comes from Jesus Christ, who from the very beginning, God had a plan to send him to redeem mankind. And you and I are a part of this unfolding story of God in this generation. And if you're made new in Christ, that river of God is flowing out of you, flowing out of you into your homes, flowing out of you into your relationships, flowing out of you when you go out into the world, wherever you go, wherever your foot treads, son or daughter of God, God's presence is with you. And you got to see that you're a part of this unfolding story of God and that God is going to culminate things in spectacular form. And so with that, I just wanted to end our time with a little communion to really reflect on how great this story God has woven together, even from Genesis, and how it all points to Christ, and how all of our own stories, if you go back into your own story, you can look how God probably has woven your story together. Had you experienced certain things, certain traumas, certain hurts and pains, but now he's come along and he's beginning to heal those. He's beginning to apply those leaves that bring healing to the nations to your life. And God wants to use you and I to continue that flow, to work with him, to cultivate and keep the kingdom of God in our generation so that we can pass it on to the next generation. Amen? Amen. Well, uh, invite the worship, whoever's coming up for worship. We're going to do communion here. Uh, here at City Life, how we do communion is we'll have a table in the back and a table up here. Um, just stand on up, come to the center aisle, grab your communion elements, head around the side, go back to your seat, keep your elements in your hand, and we'll take them together. Amen. as I was praying about our communion time together I just really felt the sense that we would ask God and pray that he would wake us up to the gloriousness of his word we put our eyes on so many things during the given day and I think he wants us to ask how much of that time is spent laid on my word Everything around us is served to distract us from knowing who God is, knowing his word, walking in his way. So, Lord, I just pray, the Lord, with us here today, God, that you would wake us up. God, if we're not waking up on, the re on a regular basis, knowing that we're walking with the creator of the universe that, God, we can talk to you, that, God, you know us, you know us by name. God, I pray that we would not become familiar with that. But, God, wake us up to who you are in our life. God, wake us up to who you are in our nation, in our world. Holy Spirit, wake us up to you. God, we thank you for your sacrifice. Lord, a sacrifice that you had planned even from Genesis. Lord, to give mankind as a sacrifice to live a life that we couldn't. And to give his life as a sacrifice so that all those who are broken, all those who are sinners, all those who are have mistakes that you think God can't forgive, it's those that people come and say, God, I give you my whole life. Do with it as you please. Father, I pray that that would be our heart cry this morning. God, steal us away from distractions and wake us up to you and your word. God, I pray that we would be your men and women that you've dreamed us to be in this hour in Jesus' name. God, thank you. Thank you, God, for this family. Thank you, God, for these friends. and God, what you're building here God, this is your body. Father, we pray and thank you for what you're doing in our lives, in the life of this church. And we thank you for your broken body and your shed blood to make all things new. 
to make our hearts new, to make our homes new. Father, we thank you for your sacrifice. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. Let's take communion elements together. Father, I pray, Lord, that you would fill every image bearer here with your spirit. God, as we surrender to you, as we live for you, God, I pray that you would go before us this week. God, open up our eyes to see opportunities that you've placed before us. God, we are your masterpiece created in you so that we can do the good things you've prepared in advance for us long ago. And so, Lord, I pray that you would wake us up and have us expected that you are going to move and operate through our life this week. Lord, thank you that you're a God that comes down and rescues sinful humanity to be brought into your family, to cultivate and keep with you. Thank you, God, for that privilege. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.